Welcome and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you uh, to our PhD uh, uh, workshops. Uh, if you recall, we started these workshops some time back and we have been discussing uh, a number of issues under these workshops. Uh, and I think as we get close to the end, I'll be reminding you about a number of things. But anyway, uh, having said that, if you recall, uh, in our workshop 14, uh, we did start a discussion that led to an important topic, and that was advancing academic arguments in research. And uh, if you recall, that topic took us quite some time, and by the way, we haven't concluded that topic. But uh, I want to tell you that uh, in today's lecture, not lecture, but in today's workshop, workshop 18, we intend to bring this to an end. Now, this important concept of advancing academic arguments in research um, took us quite some good time, but specifically handling topics like what academic arguments are in research. We did also go through the language uh, of arguments, if you recall, ladies and gentlemen, and that was in our workshop 14. I took you through what I called the Tormen model, uh, and then from there we really went to the importance of arguments, importance of the major components that constitute an argument, like claims, for instance. Uh, we talked about data, uh, uh, qualification, rebuttal, and so forth. So I hope you still remember those things, ladies and gentlemen. Now, that was workshop 14, and that's where we started uh, our discussions on arguments. Now, we went to workshop 15, and uh, in workshop 15, we did discuss original contribution in research. And uh, of course, we looked at things like having a reason to be original, uh, and of course, what it means to be original in uh, business management, in social sciences, generally speaking. And of course, we also looked at ways, or what we call uh, a fast, way to find some original contributions, ladies and gentlemen, but we also looked at originality through intellectual problems. So those are the things that we looked at, uh, including uh, construction of conflict diagrams, and uh, we also uh, looked at how you can be original using conflict diagrams, and uh, we also went into what we call assumptions, uh, and we did say that you can actually challenge uh, existing assumptions, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Now, of course, that was uh, workshop uh, 15. In workshop 16, ladies and gentlemen, we did look at original contribution and conflict diagrams, how you can use conflict diagrams uh, to uh, contribute knowledge to a particular discipline. And I did uh, take you through how you can construct conflict diagrams. And um, of course, from actions, how you can construct conflict diagrams from actions uh, or decisions, and how you can actually construct them from what we call undesirable states. Uh, I hope you still remember. And then, of course, we looked at many other issues like problem formulation and reformulation, ladies and gentlemen. So from there, we proceeded to our workshop 17, still advancing the same uh, thesis or argument, and that is academic arguments. So under our workshop 17, we looked at original contribution from conflict diagrams. And we really took some good time now discussing uh, how you can use uh, uh, diagrams to identify original contributions. 
and uh, we specifically discussed issues of problem formulation and reformulation, I hope you still remember, uh, identifying assumptions and challenging those assumptions, ladies and gentlemen. So those are the things that we did discuss and I do not really intend to uh, spend too much time and waste too much time discussing those issues, ladies and gentlemen, because we have gone through them and uh, I know that um, you really appreciate uh, what we call uh, being original in whatever you do because that is what is required at the PhD level and uh, at whatever research level uh, you will be required uh, to be original and to contribute to an existing field or knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our workshop 18 and in workshop 18 we continue with the same discussions we are having a discourse over originality in academic research so our topic today is original contribution through provocative questions so you can still be original by raising provocative questions and uh, uh, our workshop today will not last a very long time. It will be relatively short. And uh, I hope you are ready to start listening to uh, the major aspects. So the outline of our discussion today will center around uh, originality uh, through the questions of the discipline. And we are talking about a discipline where you intend to contribute knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. Then from there, the second aspect we shall discuss is uh, what we call the Van Fransen analysis. And of course, here we shall be dealing with the theory of why questions. And uh, that's what uh, Van Fransen advances. And Van Fransen is a philosopher, uh, actually uh, a logician, right? And has done a lot of work in the area of logic and therefore we need to appreciate Van Fransen's analysis. Uh, remember we are dealing with questions, right? How you can be original using questions in that particular discipline. The third aspect that we shall be covering is uh, doing a Van Fransen, Fransen analysis. So you must know how to make right how to do a van fransen analysis and if you can do that very well then you'll be able to uh, uh to, to 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 be original and do a great job ladies and gentlemen the fourth element that we shall be discussing today are what we call relational analysis technique right still you can use a relational analysis technique uh, to be original in your research and then after the relational analysis technique, ladies and gentlemen, we shall be concluding our discourse today. Right, the books that I've always asked you to read are the same books, you know them. Arnold Wenzel, 2017-2018, and that is really a guide to argumentative research writing and thinking. Uh, I've also asked you to read Alverson and uh, Sandberg, 2011, Generating Research Questions through problematization, ladies and gentlemen. So, welcome, and we can now, I'm sure we are ready to start, right? So, we'll start with the originality through the questions of the discipline. Now, as you will notice, ladies and gentlemen, science may progress from problem to problem. Don't forget that, science may, pro may progress from problem to problem, but research into these problems only happen if they give rise to questions. Because research pursues answers to questions. Remember, as researchers, we've got a number of questions, right? And we are always confronted with questions. And by the way, whenever you undertake 
a particular study and you conclude that particular study, right, at the end of the day, a number of questions will come up during the process of either undertaking research or during the process of concluding that particular study. Therefore, research must come up to undertake studies in those particular questions that have been raised. And as you can see here, while questions may give the impression of being open to many answers, in reality, ladies and gentlemen, every question is an argument that limits us only to a small range of answers. So you may get that impression, right, especially after, uh, uh, after undertaking a study to answer a particular question because we deal with the research questions, right? Now, when you try to answer that research question, right, you may get an impression of being open to many answers, right? But in reality, every question is an argument that limits us to only a small range of answers, ladies and gentlemen. So we can't, we can't answer everything. We can't answer everything related to that particular study. So there will be a number of questions that will remain unanswered, and that's why other researchers actually uh, come up to uh, continue advancing knowledge in that particular discipline, especially where answers are not yet known. Now, that's why I've already told you, ladies and gentlemen, that in this workshop, I'll focus on questions, right? And more specifically, how questions can become problematic and how questions can become a technique for finding, right, interesting new questions. So questions can become a technique for finding interesting new questions, ladies and gentlemen. But I should also say at this material time that even in and of itself, a new question is an original contribution if it opens up people's minds to the possibility of new ideas and methods. So we are saying that those particular questions that we are talking about, right, or what is called a new question in this case, the questions that arise after undertaking a study, those questions that remain unanswered, right, so even, I'm saying that, even in and of itself, a new question is an original contribution if it opens up people's minds to the possibility of new ideas and methods. And that's why when you are undertaking research, we always ask you to articulate what is new. What are you saying that other researchers have not said? So as a PhD student, you must get into this, right? And you must understand exactly what you are doing so that you are able to do a good study or undertake uh, a good study, ladies and gentlemen. So if that question, right, opens up people's minds to the new ideas or the possibility of new ideas and methods, then can we start talking about originality, right? Or uh, you coming up with something that is very new. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, the key to original contribution is to challenge questions and find new ones. So what we should be doing at this material time is to challenge questions and find new questions. Because uh, questions can deceptively uh, be limiting. I'm sure you know that very well. Questions uh, can be deceptively limiting, right? Uh, and especially when you are uh, aiming at producing original research, you have to question these questions, right? So I know these are research questions, all right? And by the way, every study centers around 
an argument, and that argument is the central thesis, and that central thesis is a central research question, right, that you are trying to answer, right, and you must be able to answer that research question. So, but of course, every question raises a number of questions, and that's why today we are dealing with uh, getting, right, or making, making an original contribution through questions, ladies and gentlemen. So, when asking, ladies and gentlemen, even the simplest question, we make many assumptions, and that is what we discussed in our previous workshop, right, that was workshop 17, right, assumptions, so challenge the assumptions, right, today I will not go into those aspects, but let me just give you an example. If I ask a question, when did you stop smoking? Right, let's imagine that's a question I put to you. Right, if I ask you, when did you stop smoking? And this is a very simple question, ladies and gentlemen. Now, when I ask that question, I not only presume that you stopped smoking, but I also assume that you did smoke at some time in your life. And those assumptions, and that's why I've told you that research centers around assumptions, questions center around questions, and that's why we must question those questions. Right, like this one that I've just given you, when did you stop smoking? So here there are two assumptum, uh, 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 sorry, assumptions, right, two assumptions. One, right, I presume that you stop smoking, but number two, I also assume that at one time in your life, you smoked, ladies and gentlemen. So, let me give you another question where you can get insights because we are dealing with questions. Right, so supposing I ask a second question, ladies and gentlemen, and the question I'm asking you is, how do we alleviate poverty? Right, so when I ask such a question, I make a number of assumptions. But assumption number one, right, is that poverty exists. I actually assume that poverty exists, right. But two, I also assume that that poverty that exists is harmful, right, and that it is in our power or powers to control it. And that's why I'm asking a question, how do we alleviate poverty? First of all, poverty exists. Two, poverty is harmful. And three, it is within our powers to control poverty. Those are three assumptions that go with that question. So whenever you have a question, assumptions also ex exist. And that's why you need to question the questions. And when you question the questions, in a way, you are also questioning the assumptions of the question. So we can make original contribution or contributions uh, to research or to our disciplines, right, or literature by questioning the questions, right, and that is very important. So, when asking a question, we automatically make the assumptions on which that question is best, uh, without being aware of, and uh, being aware of it. And in most cases, this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen. We are never aware of all the assumptions that we make when we utter statements when we come up with questions, right? And at this level, PhD level, you must be able to question. And that's why as a PhD, you should never simply say anything anyhow, right? You, 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 you now learn to think, right? And that's why we talk about critical thinking. You go through logic. We go through argumentation. 
Right, all these things that we go through, we go through philosophy. All these things that we go through, ladies and gentlemen, help us, right, as PhD people, as people who are preparing to be independent researchers, right, to try and question everything. Never take things for granted. Somebody comes to you and makes a statement and says, uh, John was killed. Right. I mean, for you to make such a statement, that means you are making a number of assumptions, right, to begin with. And those assumptions must be questioned, right. And even when you go out and start looking for evidence, right, there are assumptions behind the investigation that you are doing, right. Because if you say it was killed, then you begin asking a number of other questions. Who killed, right? Or what killed him? And why? All sorts of things come up, ladies and gentlemen. So when asking a question, remember, you automatically make an assumption uh, on which that question is best. Uh, and sometimes, and most, in most cases, without being aware of it. And it is these implicit assumptions, ladies and gentlemen, that are, that are dangerous because they limit us to only deriving answers that follow from them. And that's why research is continuous. You make assumptions, but those assumptions limit you, right? And you cannot even state with certainty that probably what you've done, right, is the best, and therefore your ideas cannot be challenged. Right. Now, if we go back to the question that I gave you, poverty, right, how can we alleviate poverty? I told you that question, right, has a number of assumptions, right. So given that this particular poverty question, ladies and gentlemen, I will avoid arguments based on alternative assumptions, such as the assumption that poverty is something outside our control. No, because the question was very clear. And the question is, yes, how can we alleviate poverty? And the alleviation of poverty aspect, right, depends on a number of assumptions that we make uh, while undertaking that research. And one of them is that um, poverty exists. Two, poverty is harmful. Three, it is within scope, within our powers to control that poverty. So the assumptions like, for example, uh, poverty is something outside our control will not come in. So I will not entertain that particular argument at that material time because I've already fixed my mind uh, on that particular aspect that it is within our powers to control poverty, ladies and gentlemen. But you can also question that kind of thinking, right? So. But I, I might also say that in this case, as you can see, there is something even more dangerous when it comes to questions, right? And those things that are very dangerous include things like the possibility that we are asking problematic questions, right? Especially the questions that don't seem to make sense. And when you're doing research, you must be very careful because it's quite easy for you to make statements that are problematic, statements that do not make any sense. In other words, your study can actually be based on a, on, 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 on what, on, on, on a question that doesn't make sense, right? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the word no sense because uh, usually people use such a word to abuse others. Eh? No sense. Something like that. But no sense actually means no sense. You can have a question, right, that does not make sense, right? There is no sense in that particular question. So we must be very careful when we are asking questions 
so that we avoid asking problematic questions, ladies and gentlemen. And um, such uh, a problematic questions, right, uh, are unanswerable uh, for a number of reasons, but I can't give you one major reason because their assumptions make an answer impossible, ladies and gentlemen. So such questions are unanswerable because the assumptions make an answer right impossible. So it's very hard for somebody to provide answers to that particular question because the question doesn't make sense and the question is problematic. So we must be very careful, right? So let me just give you again another question since we are dealing with the questions. For example, the question, why are you late, right? So the question, why are you late, assumes that you are late, right? And that's an assumption. Why are you late? Why are you late assumes that you are late. Now, if that assumption is false, the question does not make sense at all. So if you were on time, ladies and gentlemen, it is not possible to answer that question. Because somebody says, why are you late? But you're on time. Right. So that question becomes problematic, ladies and gentlemen. So as with problems, ladies and gentlemen, problematic questions can only be answered by adding, changing, or rejecting the assumption imposed by such questions. So if you want the question to make sense, then you add something, or you change something, or you reject the assumption. Now, if you add something there, right, then of course the question will read differently. It won't read, right, why are you late? Now, if you reject the assumption of somebody being late, the framing of the question will change, right? And you have something that is totally different, ladies and gentlemen. So, I want to tell you that a discipline that does not question its own questions, a discipline that does not question its own assumptions, right? Because questions, right, have assumptions embedded in them. There is no question that doesn't have assumptions. Even your topics that you are going to undertake, you are going to study during your PhD, are based on certain assumptions. You are making certain assumptions. Right, so even disciplines, eh? a discipline like geography, a discipline like history, a discipline like psychology, a discipline like marketing, a discipline like finance, a discipline like accounting, right, is based on a number of assumptions. Therefore, a discipline that does not question its own assumptions, a discipline that does not question its own questions, right, ladies and gentlemen, will most likely waste valuable time and energy on problematic questions that don't have answers. So once you question, right, the questions, you question the assumptions, it means that you are advancing in knowledge. Now, if you don't question those things, it simply means you will be having problematic, right, uh, questions attracting no answer at all. Like the case I gave you, where you let, but the fellow is not let to begin with. So you must question. So disciplines need researchers. Uh, and of course, it is these researchers who can see the assumptions of the disciplines questions and challenge them, ladies and gentlemen. Challenge those questions, challenge those assumptions, and propose new questions. And that's what we are doing in research. Now, the question, right, a question is quite difficult, right? The question, a question is quite difficult in the absence of systematic approach, right? So, in other words, for every question that you have, 
you will have a systematic approach of undertaking the study. Now that question will be very hard, right, if you do not undertake a systematic process of inquiry. Therefore, your questions, once you have challenged those questions, it is not a problematic question because you can challenge the assumptions and you'll be able to move in, ladies and gentlemen. So, as I have already said in this workshop, I'll offer one approach to finding new questions, uh, which will help direct you, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sure you'll be able to navigate through uh, quite easily. And uh, uh, later on, of course, not under the same series of navigating the PhD terrain, I will outline other approaches, ladies and gentlemen. Right, but right now, allow me to uh, outline or to take you through one approach of questioning the questions, right? And I hope you are, you'll give me your undivided attention uh, so that we are able to move on very well. Now, this uh, method that I'm going to give you is called the Van Fransen analysis. I've already talked about the Van Fransen analysis. Right, and um, Van Fransen analysis, I know you have a problem with the way it is written, uh, uh, but you can see it on the screen here. Van Fransen analysis. And it is referred to as the theory of why questions. Theory of why questions. Van Fransen analysis is very, very useful. Ladies and gentlemen, so as you can see here, as I have already said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there is a group of philosophers who have devoted their time to try and specialize in the field of logic of questions. And of course, Bart Van Fransen is one of them. Right, and uh, he created what you call a theory of why. Why is W-H-Y, why? Why questions, right? Now, something very interesting here is that while Van Fransen applied his theory only to the why questions, other philosophers showed that it can be applied to any question that calls for an explanation. And in research, ladies and gentlemen, right, that's what we are dealing with. You study reality, right? And every reality that you have calls for explanations, possible explanations, and that's what we are doing. You see something happening and you begin asking yourself, why? Is it like this? Right, and I have seen many people doing this very well. They extract, right, reality from out there. After extracting this reality, what do they do? They start looking for a net or nets, right? And in this case, I'm talking about theories. They start looking for theories or a theory that can best explain or better explain that reality out there. Right, so if you can pick one theory that covers everything and explain that reality, that's okay. But if one theory does not explain it very well, then you'll use a multi-theoretical approach. Right, so you are likely to mix and combine one or two theories, right, and try to explain that reality out there. So what I'm talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is that Van Fransen technique of the why question, right, can be used, right, uh, and applied to any question that calls for an explanation or explanations. And of course, that's what we do in research, ladies and gentlemen. So, in this workshop again, I can only say that I'll show you how to analyze questions using the Van Fransen's method of analysis. And in fact, very soon I'll be using an example that you are very familiar with. 
right, that is, that is found in the Bible, right? The, the issue of Adam and Eve, you know that very well, right? Uh, eating the, 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 the forbidden, right, uh, fruit, ladies and gentlemen. Now, although I may not go into the philosophy of the fruit, and I will not really take that direction, right? I will, we shall use a metaphorical uh, 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 fruit, ladies and gentlemen, because metaphors are used in research even when you examine a theory, right? In other words, you pick, right, those particular metaphors that you can use to explain your reality out there, right? So that's very important. Now, ladies and gentlemen, something you need to know here. Since in our previous uh, workshops we've been talking about conflict diagrams, I hope you still remember our conflict diagrams, uh, right from our figure five, right, where we had that goal, and then the need and the actions, right? And that's why we discussed issues of A, right? The actions or decisions, right? And of course, uh, from A, we had delta A, if you remember, right? And then from A, we went to what we call R, and R were actions. And then from actions to uh, what we call the goal, or goals, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see, unlike the conflict diagram, approach, right, that's the approach we had, that is most appropriate to real world problems. A Van Frensen analysis can be used with purely theoretical issues as well, provided you have a question. And therefore the question must be there. So Van Frensen identifies the main elements of a question as being, right, one, the topic. So Van Fransen technique requires you to have a topic, right? And these are the elements of a question. And the elements of the question are the topic. And the topic here is what you try to explain, which is also the most important assumption of the question. Now the second aspect, as you can see, the contract is what we call the contrast class. Right, contrast, you must have a contrast. Contrast class, and the contrast class here is what you call alternative ways to answer the question. So you will have the question, right? The, so in other words, you have the topic, right? And the topic represents what you're trying to explain, and that is the most important assumption of the question, ladies and gentlemen. So the second bit, the central class, and the, the central, right, and this is the contrast, the contrast, the contrast class, right, these are alternative ways to answer the question. And the third element uh, is what we call the relevance relation, relevance relation. And the relevance relation here constitutes uh, what is taken to count right, as a relevant answer. Not all answers are relevant. Some of the answers you give do not count. So they are not really taken to be relevant answers. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's go back to Van Fransen's uh, 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 model, the why questions, right? The questions, in other words, you must question every question. So it uses the questioning approach, ladies and gentlemen. So the Van Fransen model uh, uses the ancient question from the Garden of Eden as an example, right? And uh, again, as you can see, uh, according to Van Fransen, he takes the metaphorical model, right? And the issue is, why did Adam eat the apple? And that's the central question. Why did Adam eat the apple? Now, if I ask that, my most basic assumption is that Adam ate the apple. So if your question is, why did Adam eat the apple? The assumption behind that is that actually Adam ate the apple. So that is the topic, right? So that is the topic of the question. Adam ate the apple. 
one can easily find the topic of why, how questions, right? By removing the why or how and then adjusting the remaining words until it forms a grammatical statement rather than a question, ladies and gentlemen. So there are actually many answers to that question. And uh, each answer comes from a different contrast class. Since every contrast, every contrast class defines an alternative way to answer the same question. So, if somebody asks a question like the one I gave you, right, that Van Fransen uses, why did Adam, Adam eat the apple? Right, and that's the question, why did Adam eat the apple? Right, then you can have a number of answers, ladies and gentlemen. So some of the possible answers are as follows. Assuming that you are using a, motif, a metaphorical apple, right, because I know others have different interpretations of the same, right? But let's take the metaphorical apple. So these are some of the, why did Adam eat the, the apple? Somebody might say, Adam was hungry, right? Adam was hungry. Then, of course, the other possible answer is that Eve was on a diet, right? Why did Adam eat the apple? Eve was on a diet. The, the, the third possible answer is that there were no bananas, right? Or, of course, other fruit, guavas. There were no guavas, right? Why did he eat these ones? And all those are possible answers, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Another one will say, well, uh, Eve tempted him, right? Why, why did he eat the apple? Eve tempted him. I think you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the possible answers, the range of possible answers. But, right, again, of these possible answers, the only one that is taken as a valid answer, ladies and gentlemen, which is based on the assumption as derived from the narratives written in the Bible and the corpus of literature reinforcing it is the last one. Why did Adam eat the apple? Because he was tempted. Somebody might say, you know, uh, he preferred meat, right? Or he preferred other things, but Eve tempted him. So he ended up taking the apple, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see in this case, we have a number of issues, right? A range of answers whenever a question is asked, right? But depending on the discipline where you are contributing knowledge, right? The discipline will certainly tell us, right, the kind of answers that make sense and the kind of questions that we must raise. So they must be discipline specific because even your contribution to knowledge, right, is discipline specific, ladies and gentlemen. So this is very, very important and that's why we need to really pay attention uh, we need to pay attention to these things, right? So, what I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, at this material time, is to show you a table, right? And uh, this table will have the kind of questions that I've just raised in the last few minutes, especially relating to Adam, right? And uh, you will be seeing these things. Uh, I'm sure you can see them on the screen right now. So this table, uh, I'll call it table uh, three, right? And this table is very important because it brings out a number of issues, as you can see, right? So, as you can see from the table, ladies and gentlemen, we have the question column. You know, these are the three things that, con that, that, that constitute the, the Van Fransen technique 
of questioning. So uh, there are three columns, as you can see here. And of course, there are also three rows, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in the first column, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see on the screen here, we have the questions, right? Uh, in the second column, as you can see, we have what we call the contrast, right? Contrast class. And in the third column, ladies and gentlemen, we have the answers, right, that we focus on. And the, uh, the ones that bring out relevance, right, of knowledge to that particular discipline, ladies and gentlemen. For example, as we saw, ladies and gentlemen, in the question that we had, the first question was, why did Adam eat the apple? Right, and of course, we had a contrast class that I showed you, right. Uh, why? We had reasons like he was hungry, he was tempted, all sorts of things. And we're talking about the metaphoric, metaphorical apple, ladies and gentlemen. So, of course, later on we saw the other relevance, and these are the answers, right, a number of answers there. And when we analyze those answers, we zero down to one particular aspect that comes from the corpus literature, corpus literature and the Bible, right? Which simply says, Adam was tempted. Because if, right, after enjoying the, 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 the fruit, he actually took the fruit uh, to Adam, and Adam did eat thereof, ladies and gentlemen. So, but now I want to emphasize something here, right? Uh, again, I think we can put that question on the, on, on the screen here so that you see it. But anyway, you can see it on the table, uh, in table three, right? The table here. Why did Adam eat the apple? Now, what I'm going to do is to change the emphasis, basing on the words in that question. The words, of course, uh, why did Adam, right, eat the apple? Now, when I emphasize Adam, and you can see it is underlined. Adam is underlined in the first question here. The second question here, right, we underline the word eat. Eat, E-A-T. Remember the question is, why did Adam eat the apple? Now we are going to put emphasis on three words, three different words, and I can assure you the contrast class will change and the answers will change, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why you must always refer to literature in your discipline. Now that, well, of course, that does not mean that you shouldn't undertake interdisciplinary research. You can, and it's important. But you compare what you are bringing to that particular discipline with what the discipline says, so that you are able to contribute knowledge, so that you are able to provide an argument so that there is an original contribution to that particular discipline, ladies and gentlemen. So, that's where we are. So let me, as you can see from the table, the table will remain there for quite some time before I put on a second table there, ladies and gentlemen. So you can see that table and this table that we are discussing. When I put emphasis on Adam, I am asking why it was Adam who ate the apple as opposed to somebody else. Right, so when I put emphasis emphasis, right, on Adam. I am asking why it was Adam. Why did, I mean, the question is, why did Adam eat the apple? Why did Adam eat the apple? It means it could have been somebody else to eat the apple, and not specifically Adam in this case. Right, so I am asking why Adam why it was Adam who ate the apple as opposed to somebody else. 
This gives us one contrast class of that question, ladies and gentlemen. Right? Why? Because there were other, and you know we are contrasting. Why Adam? You contrast Adam with another person who was there, and that was Eve. Right? So the contrast class will have Adam and Eve, as you can see. Why did Adam and not another person? Right. And of course, the answers you can see will focus on why Adam was the one who did it. Right. Why? Why? It was Adam who did it. And that is the relevance relation, ladies and gentlemen. Right, let's shift right, our questioning, ladies and gentlemen, and then see what will come up. In other words, we, we shift the emphasis from now Adam, and we put it on one aspect called it. Right, and then we, we see what will happen. Right. So when I put, or maybe I can even start by putting emphasis on, on the apple, apple itself. So when I put emphasis on the apple, ladies and gentlemen, I am interested in answers that explain why an apple was chosen over other fruits. Ladies and gentlemen, assuming that there were other fruits. Why? Why an apple? Right. Why apple? Why apple? And not guavas. Right. And probably not anything else. Why apples? And not bananas. Right. I think you can see when you shift the emphasis. Right, the contrast class will change. So, if you will bring in that element, why Adam had to eat an apple and not anything else, when asking a question like this, I make an assumption, right? And if any of them, I mean the assumptions are wrong, my question becomes problematic, right? I assume that the topic Adam ate the apple is true, right? But it may not be true, ladies and gentlemen. If Adam did not eat the apple, and if Adam never existed, this question is problematic. That is, it does not make sense. And if the apple, in the sense that I call it metaphorical, means something different, then this becomes a problematic question. It means it cannot be answered, right, as you can see. But we can always change this kind of thing. And of course, that's what it is. I assume that one contrast class is the appropriate one, and that others are incorrect, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why when you put emphasis on Adam, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see still on the screen here, when the emphasis is put on Adam, the contrast class as we know it in the Bible will be Eve, right? And of course, I'm asking why? So why Adam was the one who did it? And that's the issue. Now, the second question, let's put now, our emphasis on eating, ladies and gentlemen. Why did Adam eat, eat the apple? The emphasis now is on eating the apple, eating, right? So the contrast class here now will change, will be not eating it or doing something else with it. And that's what it is, that's a contrast class. Right, now the emphasis here, as you can see, the answer that I'm looking out for will be why the eating happened. Why the eating happened, 
Right, and that's why the emphasis now is on eat, eating, right. So I can also now change and have, I think you still see this on the screen here. The third question is, why did Adam eat the apple? Right. Now, of course, here now the emphasis is on the apple, and I've already given you that. Right. Uh, so there were other fruits in the garden, but why choose the apple to begin with? Right. Or there were other types of fruits or food for that matter. Why did he have to choose this? So the contrast class would be an apple versus other fruits or foods. And then the other issue under relevance relation, why the apple was so appealing that he had to pick the apple, ladies and gentlemen. So that is where we are, ladies and gentlemen. And that is what we call the Van Fransen technique. And Van Fransen uses certainly the issue of the apple. And you'll find this in Wenzel. 2017 and 2018, right? So, once we understand this way of analyzing a question, if we understand this particular way or methodology of analyzing questions, ladies and gentlemen, right, we can see that there are, in fact, many questions that are hidden in a question. You always ask one question, but there are so many other questions hidden in that question. And they also seek for an alternative explanation or alternative explanations. And those particular questions that are hidden behind those questions, right, a question hidden behind a question, right, also tells us the assumptions that underlie that particular question or questions that are hidden in that particular question. Right, uh, so the, uh, the, the, the example I've given you brings this out very well. So there are a number of questions hidden in a question and therefore many ways to answer the same question. And that's why we are always struggling with research. And at this material time you really discover that it's very difficult to interpret certain things, especially when they are written, and that's why you'll find several, or what we call multiple interpretations. Right, of course I know for some people, right, uh, they may actually say, no, this is a revelation, right, was revealed hmm? and to me, and therefore this is what it is. Right, well, because a question has so many other questions in it, and they are hidden, and there are many answers, they are also hidden. So the, the very example I've given here of Adam, why Adam, right, uh, why did Adam, why did Adam eat the fruit? If I put emphasis on Adam, the contrast class is Adam and Eve. If I put emphasis on eating, right, so the issue will be now on that particular way, right. So you are dealing with eating and not eating, or the fellow could have done anything else with that particular fruit. Now, when I put emphasis on the apple, right, why did Adam eat the apple? That's an interpretation. The interpretation here is that the man could have eaten something else, and not specifically the apple, because there were so many other fruits. It could have been an orange, could have been a mango. Why specifically an apple and not a mango or an orange? So you can see, a question, one question may raise a number of questions. And that's what we do in research. We attempt to do this, ladies and gentlemen. So, as you can see, this is very important. And therefore, we need to find some ways of uh, answering those particular questions. And some ways I can tell you are wrong, while others are right, ladies and gentlemen. So. It's very important that we do that. Some ways of answering are correct, are correct answers, but we don't regard them as valid because they fit into contrast classes, ladies and gentlemen. The answer Adam ate the apple, right, because there was no banana, sounds more like you are trying to make a joke, incidentally, right. 
It is the kind of answer that you might give if you, are, if you assumed the third contrast class, ladies and gentlemen, as you've seen in that table that I've just shown you. So, but it is not the answer is not necessarily wrong, right? Only that it is based on their uh, other assumptions, as you can see, right? But many other people will not take it seriously, and they will simply joke at joke, or make jokes, and they will say that you're a joker, right? So sometimes there are more than one answer within a contrast class. So the implicit assumptions within a discipline, within a discipline, like in this case we are talking about theology, leads it not only to favor one contrast class, but also to prefer one answer with a, a contrast over others. Now in the second contrast class, for example, we may find two answers. He ate it because it was, he was tempted. Right, he ate it because he was hungry, but only the first is regarded as being correct, right? Again, this is not because the second one is necessarily incorrect or wrong, but because the discipline rules it out. And this, what discipline are we talking about? We're talking about theology, right? Or religious discipline will rule that out, ladies and gentlemen, right? So, I want now to introduce another table that I'll call table three. And I don't think we shall go beyond this table, right? We shall discuss this and probably come to a, uh, 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 and close, ladies and gentlemen. But of course, we shall also go to the analysis that I told you about. So this uh, table is very, very, very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. And therefore, we need to understand the table very well. So we want to look at how we can do what we call the Van Fransen analysis, right? Van Fransen analysis is based on a number of things, right? So I want to take you through step by step, right? Take you through a step by step, right? Uh, process through the Van Fransen analysis, right? So how we can do a Van Fransen analysis. So let's start with a question. You know, we had a, the other question that we have been dealing with was, why did Adam eat the what? The apple. Now let's take another question. Suppose someone has a question like, why do countries manage migration in the way they do? Why do countries manage migration in the way they do. Right, so if you look at that question, that question is much too vague, as you can see. It's very vague, vague actually, it's vague, too vague. So our first step will be, we make the question more specific and meaningful. Because you can't say, why do countries manage migration in the way they do? The question is vague, and we must make that question specific and more meaningful. So let me take you through the process that will help you rephrase that question and make it specific and meaningful. So we have a number of steps as articulated by Van Fransen analysis. Step number one, refine the question. Refine the question until it is sufficiently meaningful to be researched. So keep on, right, keep on rephrasing the question. Keep on refining the question. So because the more meaningful the question is, the easier it is to find contrast classes. Because according to the Van Fransen, you, you have a question, but you must have contrast classes. And then from there, you go to the answers, which give relevance to those contrast classes. So that's what you have to do, refine, refine, refine. And Suppose that after this step, the question changes to, right? Let me give you, after refining it, supposing now you come to this level and the question becomes, why do developed countries 
resist the gains they can obtain from unrestricted migration. I think you can see the original question, right, really different. Why do countries manage migration in the way they do? If you remember our figure eight under conflict diagram, figure eight, figure seven, figure six, five and four, we brought in the issue of migration, specifically figure eight, if you recall. That was a workshop 17. So we're dealing with issues of migration, right? Uh, where we had issues of um, uh, uh, actually reasons why, right, countries, especially developed countries, restrict people from entering their countries, right? We had the sending countries, if you remember, and we had the receiving countries. So you have the developing world sending people to the developed world, right, for reasons best known for themselves, because they don't control the migration process, right? But people go, and they have reasons why they move from one country to another country. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen. So, why, why do they, right? Now supposing, because there was another argument, if you remember, when we had A and Delta A, that they actually resist because migration has significant gains associated with it. But those fellows actually restrict, right? So supposing after the first step of refining, the question changes to why do developed countries resist the gains, right, they can obtain from restricted migration? Right, now if that is the case, we now move to step number two. So step number two is find the topic and check it. Because now we have removed the word why and turned the remaining words into a grammatical statement. And that's what we do right in this case. So under step number two, we remove the word why and turn the remaining words, after removing why, into a grammatical statement. In other words, you attempt to really come up with a sentence that makes sense. So the topic in this case is, developed countries resist the gains they can right, obtain from unrestricted migration. And that's the statement now. Developed countries resist the gains they can obtain from restricted, not restricted, but unrestricted. Developed countries resist the gains they can obtain from unrestricted migration. So the question now has changed to this, as you can see. And this is now a sentence, a grammatical statement. So this is also the fundamental assumption of the question. And if this were not true, the question would be problematic and the analysis could not continue. So at this level, level number two, ensure that the evidence is strong enough to warrant the topic that developed economies are indeed restricting and restricted migration. So that's what it is, ladies and gentlemen. So we move to step number three, identify the different nouns and verbs, right? I hope you are seeing this on the screen, right? Uh, this is our table. Uh, we've called it table, uh, table four, right? So all these that I'm talking about, step number one, step number two, right, somehow are helping us to uh, articulate the issues summarized in the table here. Right, just to take you back for you to remember, uh, because I know you can easily forget, we are dealing with doing a Van Fransen analysis. And uh, as you can see in table four here, we are dealing with questions of why do developed countries resist the net gains they can obtain from unrestricted migration. So I, I, we did, I did tell you that step number one, ladies and gentlemen, refine the question until it is sufficiently meaningful to be researched. Right, and that's what it is. Then step number two, find the topic and, find the topic and check it. 
So we just removed the word why. And if you look at the table here, the question was, why do developed countries resist? Right. So the contrast class, because you must find the contrast class here, you have developing countries. So you have developed countries resisting unrestricted migration from developing. So if you are going to contrast, it is developed versus the underdeveloped or the developing in this case, as you can see. That's a contrast class. And of course, the answer there is what causes right, developed countries to manage migration inflow. Why? So that takes us to uh, certainly the uh, step number two, which I've already gone through, developed countries resist. In other words, you refine, refine until it becomes a sentence that makes sense. Developed countries resist the gains they can obtain from restrict, unrestricted migration and make sure that you get sufficient evidence to prove the point that you are trying to, uh, to, 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 to put across. Otherwise, if you don't have evidence this will be a problematic question. So you begin with a question, refine the question, and put it into a grammatical statement. Then after that, we go to step number three, identify the different nouns and verbs. So in every sentence that you have made, uh, or statement you have made, identify verbs and nouns. Because those are the ones we are going to emphasize now. Right? At a different level, we emphasize nouns. Another level, we emphasize verbs, as you can see. So in this case of our uh, developed countries resisting the gains they can obtain from unrestricted migration, right? These, the nouns and verbs are uh, developed countries. Right? The other word is resist. The other word is gains. Right? The other one is can obtain. The other one is unrestricted migration. Right, so I put developed countries and unrestricted migration together as they form one unit of meaning. So after that, we construct a table similar to the one that you see, you are seeing on the screen. And uh, this is done in the contrast column uh, of that particular table. And I hope you have seen that contrast column uh, because you've got the first one which has questions as opposed to is a contrast column. And then, of course, we have relevance there. So after that, ladies and gentlemen, we now go to step number five. And I want you to relate the steps I'm giving you to this table four. Right. Step number five in this case is to identify the possible relevance question. You see that in the last column, right? The last column of this table here. Identify the possible relevance relations, right, in each contrast class. So you've got a contrast class, but for each contrast class, you must identify the relevance questions, right? And that's very important, relevance. So, and we only pick those ones which are valid we ignore the invalid ones. So, and of course, at this level, ladies and gentlemen, be open to possibilities, right? Be open to a number of possible relations. Oh, and here, the relations, the possible relations must be relevant, right? Uh, and of course, that's where we shall be. So we go to step number six. After that, ask yourself the following question, right? Ladies and gentlemen, you ask yourself the following uh, to find new questions that can lead to original contribution. Because we are dealing with original contribution and you want to have a study or research that is very interesting. We want to have an interesting study. So after you, you've come up with the questions, right, and you have different areas of emphasis depending on the nouns. Right, just look at the table again. In question number one, we emphasize developed, right, in this table, right, table four. If you emphasize developed, the contrast class will be the developing, and the answers will be what causes. 
Now, if in the second question there are 2A, I'm sure you are seeing it on the table, sorry, in the, in the screen, right? Why do developed countries? Now, the issue is countries. We are emphasizing countries. Now, when you emphasize countries, the possible contrast class will be cities, for instance, or states, right? You have countries that have states. So you can, that will, that's a possible uh, contrast class. So you contrast a country, right, with probably cities, with the provinces, if you have provinces, with the districts, if you have districts, if you the counties, if you have counties, with the cities, if you have cities, that kind of thing. And of course, the answers, right, uh, in, ter in terms of relevance, will be in terms of why national migration. Because the other one now was international migration. You are moving from one country to another country. So you are dealing with developed versus developing. That was the contrast. But the moment you say countries, so if you're emphasizing countries, you start now examining the local conditions within that country, uh, depending on the structures that you have. You can start with, the, for instance, parishes, right? You can actually go to uh, counties, uh, sub-counties. You can go to counties. Then you can go to districts. Then you can go to states if you have states. Then you can go to cities, that kind of thing. So you start relating now or dealing with the migration within the country. And therefore, the, relevance, the relevant question will be why national migration cannot or should not be restricted uh, in the same way as international migration. So that's what it is. So you go to now the third one, right? Uh, that is now the 2B, right? Why do countries resist, right? We are still on countries in this case. And therefore, we can actually now deal with countries and other institutions, ladies and gentlemen. So we can now go to the third question. And the third question there, I think you can still see it in the table, ladies and gentlemen. The issue we are dealing with is now the word resist. Why do countries resist? So we must find a contrast class for resist, right? And a contrast class for resist, right, will be ignore, will be allow, right, will be encourage. And therefore, in terms of the relevant questions, you have explanations as to why countries actively resist possible gains. So the question has now changed because you are dealing with resist. Right. Instead of encouraging, because that's the contrast class, they are resisting. Instead of allowing, they are resisting. So the question has now changed. Right. Uh, so, of course, we can now uh, change the, the, what? Uh, the emphasis again. In question number four, we change the emphasis and we deal with uh, the word yeah, uh, gains. Right. We have underlined gains. Why resist, why those countries actually resist the gains? So what they are resisting now is not the migration. Uh -uh. They are resisting the gains from that migration. So this question has now also changed totally. So the contrast class will be now will be constituted by losses, right? Because if you resist the gains, you lose out to begin with. And therefore the questions that uh, you'll have there in the relevant section in the last column Right, will include things like identifying the gains that exist, right, and, uh, and, and of course, how they come to be. So that is on the aspect of gains. Now, in question num number six, as you can see, let's now emphasize unrestricted. If we emphasize unrestricted, ladies and gentlemen, the contrast class will now change to restricted and prohibited, and the argument or the relevance question will also change, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, I will not really spend too much time on that, but let me take you to the seventh one. Seventh one, seventh one is uh, if we put emphasis on migration as a concept, if we put emphasis on migration, ladies and gentlemen, right, then the contrast class will change. Therefore, migration will go with the issues like 
capital flows, right? With the issues like idea inflows, with the issues like trade. And the relevance question will now be why gains from migration are more important than those from other forms of economic integration. So I think you can see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, where we are and how we move. And all those things take us through the various stages that I gave you, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe uh, for some people who have not been following very well, when we are doing a Van France analysis, I can actually summarize the steps for you. One, refine the question until it is sufficiently meaningful, right, to be researched. Uh, two, find the topic and check it, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, at the end of the day, you must uh, put that into a statement that seems to make sense, right, and you provide evidence to support that. Three, you identify the different nouns and verbs in that statement and uh, find out exactly where you want to put the emphasis because the question can change. And for you as a PhD students, this must be quite useful to you because at one stage you are going to defend your work, right, and to be a public defense and people are likely to misunderstand your topic and misinterpret and they can easily uh, throw you off uh, if you're not prepared. Step number four, I said define the contrast classes uh, from the changes uh, in the meaning of the question. And then after that, uh, five, you identify the possible relevance relations. And step number six, ask yourself the following questions, which contrast class does the discipline favor? So the discipline comes in here. Does it miss the significance of other contrast classes? What assumptions does it make uh, that blinds it to other contrast classes? Right? Does it even realize that there are other contrast classes? Do any of those other contrast classes suggest better or more interesting questions? Do any of the relevance questions or relations suggest answers or approaches? Uh, not previously considered, all of that is very important. Remember I told you for every research question, you have a number of hidden questions, a number of hidden assumptions, and you can make a contribution by simply questioning those things, and that's what we are doing right here. If you put emphasis on specific, specific words, you get different assumptions, different questions, different answers, and then you begin interrogating uh, what you've come up with, and I can assure you'll be able to make original contribution, ladies and gentlemen. So all this is very important because after you've done that, you must be able to problematize what you have. And uh, because you have a range of possibilities and you know what the discipline has already done in terms of research, how far knowledge has developed in that area, and uh, the current level or debate, the current debate in the literature. So you can always advance your own arguments, ladies and gentlemen. And it's very important that you do so. So look at it, and um, here we are dealing with the relational analysis. Remember, the last right column is what we call the answers. We, we, we deal with the answers, right? Or what we call the relevance relation. And those are the answers that must be provided at the end of the day. So you raise a question, right, that must give you an answer or a range of answers, ladies and gentlemen, like in the case of Adam. Why did Adam right, eat? It could have been anybody else. Why is it that it's Adam who ate? And you people, uh, most of the times when something happened to you, you ask a question, why me? Why me? That means you are at that level, right? The focus is on the individual. Why me? 
Why not another person? Right. So there the emphasis is the person. Instead of looking at what has happened, right, and then focus on it, you focus on the person. And all those are possibilities. So under relational analysis technique, again, as we see from Wenzel, there is that technique is very important because it can help you identify, ladies and gentlemen, the assumptions on which that particular question or a question or questions is best. Now, this technique, ladies and gentlemen, is also useful when you're writing literature reviews, right? And uh, I hope you'll be able to uh, articulate that very well. So once you use that technique, uh, the technique will produce assumptions. So, and I'm still focusing on really on the last column there, as you can see, the relevance uh, section, relevance relation, uh, as you can see in the diagram. So you, when you use that technique, you'll be able to produce assumptions, uh, which can then be challenged. Uh, so becoming the, really the seeds, you see when you challenge those assumptions, right, now those become the seeds uh, for original contribution as already explained in this research, ladies and gentlemen. So when you raise, if you follow this table, uh, the way I have given it to you and the issues that have come up, certainly, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be able to make an original contribution or original contribution to the discipline using the Van Fransen technique. Let me conclude, right. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm concluding by saying that to make an original contribution, you need two things, right? One, you need a reason for being. And two, you need the beginner's mind, right? A reason for being. Remember, in research, we deal with issues of philosophy, right? And when we deal with the issues of philosophy, we deal with ontology. Right, and when we deal with ontology, we are dealing with reality. And when we are dealing with reality, we are actually concerned with the issues that constitute that reality and finding explanations. When we deal with metaphysics, we are concerned with being. Right, and that is really philosophy. And when we go to epistemology, we are dealing with knowledge. So we are always moving around these things. When we deal with axiology, we are dealing with the values. And then we move to methodology, and then the methods, ladies and gentlemen. They are all intertwined. I mean, they're all together, wrapped up together. There's no you can remove methodology from the philosophy of science. You can't remove metaphysics from ontology, ladies and gentlemen. They all move together, and that's why when we read your work, we are supposed to see these things right from the introduction because we can tell where you are coming from and the assumptions that you have and your philosophical orientation, the way you see things, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, for you to make an original contribution, ladies and gentlemen, you need, one, the reason for being, and then two, the beginner's mind, right? So, and of course you can see uh, cultiv cultivating reasons for being is what makes an original contribution. So always cultivate that mind, right? Cultivate that mind for being, right? Because it is what makes original contribution worthwhile. And of course, the other aspect is the mindset. The mindset, which we have called the beginner's mind, right? It's very, very pivotal because if you have one orientation, you cannot, be move, you cannot be moved, you don't want to change your thinking, you only have a fixed kind, fixed way of do, looking at things, you never make an original contribution in research. No, because we are dealing with social sciences, right? The reality we see today will actually disappear tomorrow. I mean, just look at uh, this concept of the workplace that we have been discussing and the literature that, um, that has been published around that concept uh, of the workplace, right? In COVID-19, when you had a lockdown, people are now working from their homes. 
So that means the, the work setting is going to change. A number of things must change. So those theoretical explanations and the knowledge that, have been, that has been developed over time now is becoming obsolete. So you must come up with the new explanations, right? And that's, why, and that's what makes research very interesting, and that's what makes the world quite interesting. Because some of the things we've been having are going to collapse completely, will go, and you'll have a new reality, ladies and gentlemen. So the new workplace now will have different things, right? And even the individuals who have been working are going to rethink, right? They've been depending on their salaries, right? And the fellow must get, um, uh, must sit somewhere, uh, and wait for a salary, whether he has worked or probably has not worked, right? Right from uh, January 1st up to December 31st, the fellow earns a salary, right? With probably putting in minimum effort. But uh, let me tell you, the organizations are going to change because they're going to be restructured also, right? They're also thinking, as the employees are thinking, the organizations are also thinking, right? And some will say, if during the COVID time we are able to reduce the number of employees because they are working in shifts now, right? As per the uh, presidential directive or directives of the leaders of the countries uh, who say that now uh, few employees must be available at the workplace like now in the banking industry. So if you had uh, 3,000 employees, this week only 50 or 40 will go to the workplace. The following week you'll have another 40. The other week we'll have another 40. Now you start thinking, if the 40 that are available this week can do the work of 3,000, and the following week the 40 will also do the work of 3,000, each is see throughout, the, throughout five months and six months, and the organization is not closing, and somehow seems to be doing very well. So that means you must actually trench, right, the other 2,000, uh, probably 950 and remain with the 50 employees. And that means cutting down costs, ladies and gentlemen. So in other words, the mindset is very important, ladies and gentlemen, as I'm saying. So two things must be their reason for being and to the beginner's mind. Right, I know that most of the books that are written in the area of research and philosophy of science, they deal with the reason for being. They never really spend quite some good time articulating the beginner's mind uh, which we certainly call the mindset of the researchers, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, in this case, I'm putting that emphasis on the beginner's mind because I know it's very important, but um, I want to leave that point to you as I close so that you start thinking about it and hopefully you'll be able to do good research. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to really thank you very much uh, for the uh, for attending the workshops. I hope you have benefited uh, from these workshops, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I want to say that this 18th workshop will be the last workshop in this series of navigating the PhD terrain. It will be the last one. I'll be coming up with more workshops. I hope you'll be uh, observing and uh, uh, and uh, trying to really wait uh, for those workshops and attend them. But uh, you've been a very nice audience. Uh, I hope you have gained something out of, this, uh, out of these workshops. And uh, I can only say, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the issue of making an original contribution and having academic arguments in research started with workshop 14, went through workshop 15, workshop 16, workshop 17, workshop 18. I know it's an important area in research. It's an important area at the PhD level. And I hope you have benefited from these workshops. I can only wish you a nice time. And I can only say, stay well, stay safe. I wish you a nice time. Bye, ladies and gentlemen.